The Glorious Church, Part 3 Discipleship in the Glorious Church. The scripture for today's part is Matthew chapter 28, verses 18 to 20. And Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority, that is, all authority, has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe everything that I've commanded you, and lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. Let's pray. Father, as we open your word again, we're praying that you would give us your spirit of wisdom and revelation, the eyes of our understanding being enlightened, that we might know the hope of your calling, that we might walk worthy of the Lord, and fulfill your purpose, Father. And we're asking that you would give us a revelation of discipleship and show us how it applies in our lives today, in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, the foundational scriptures for this whole series is based in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 25 to 33. And it says that he sanctify and cleanse the church with the washing of water by the word that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. And then Revelation 19.7 speaks of the marriage of the Lamb and his wife has made herself ready. So there's clearly two parts of this. Jesus is washing us with the word and the bride makes herself ready. And I think one of the ways we can help to make ourselves ready is to position ourselves to be washed by the word. <laughs> Amen. There's lots of other things we have to obey in the New Testament, but this part is crucial for this last preparation as we come to the glorious church. Now, obviously, a glorious church is a church in which Jesus and the Father get all the glory. It's a church full of his manifest presence, but it's also a holy church. There's no wrinkle or blemish. It's a pure church with no division in the heart, no double-mindedness and no idols, nothing dividing the heart. It's all focused on Jesus, just like any fiance would before the wedding. Amen. And so we've got to really think about Jesus at this time. And what we've seen in this series is that he is the bridegroom. The church is the bride for which he's preparing an abode right now, according to John 14. And he's excited about the wedding coming up. And the church has to be made ready. He's excited about that. And I believe that he's right behind every preacher who preaches his word. He's enthusiastically waking me up and getting me up, preparing sermons, getting teaching ready, putting it on the internet, writing it into books, doing everything I can to get that word out because it's important to him. Just like my wedding was important to me when I was a fiance and leading up to the wedding, it was all very important. It had my full focus and I wasn't focused on anything else or any other girlfriends. They were all out of the question. I was 100% ready, preparing, getting everything fixed and in order. And that's how Jesus would be today. He's excited. And as we found out last week, we certainly know that all weddings are expensive. It takes a large amount of finances to do a wedding well. And Jesus' Father is also preparing to provide for this wedding. He will provide for it, but he does it through ordinary people like the ones who followed Jesus and provided for his ministry. So we need to be aware of that. The glorious church will be a church with an abundance of finances to finance missionaries, the preaching of the gospel, the making of disciples, putting out the word of God and to building great facilities if they're needed and to getting cameras and getting the word out onto the TV, getting it out onto the internet, getting it out in every way possible. There will be ample provision or the church would not be glorious according to the law of first mention. So there's no doubt that Jesus is returning for this. It's no doubt that we have to take on his vision for this. And the father's vision is for a huge and growing family. His vision's all about family. It's about a son. It's about a daughter-in-law or a bride for his son. It's about children. And it's about a huge and growing family. So there's no doubt in my mind 
that God's vision is for new people to be added to his church and then for them to become disciples because they have to be trained in family culture. They have to be trained in correct behavior, then in knowledge, in skills. They have to be trained in work related skills and then all kinds of other skills to do with getting along with others, fitting in, understanding about worship, understanding about their role, and they're being made disciples. And then they grow in their discipleship, some by being taught in a classroom, some by being trained with much love and repetition, like you do with children, you know, clean your teeth, have you clean your teeth, go now, clean your teeth, wash your hands, it's bedtime. You've got to tell them that repeatedly. And that's what training is all about. And so some of the growth in discipleship is going to be about repeated training, coaching, correction and assessing. And when people are assessed as ready to go to a new level of responsibility, discipleship is also about releasing them into that. They start doing it under supervision and can eventually do it without supervision as they begin to train and develop others. But of course, we're always under the direct leadership of the Holy Spirit. Remember those that are led by the Spirit of God. These are the sons of God. Amen. This all takes discipleship. So as I said, today's scripture is Matthew 28, 18 to 20, where he said, all authority has been given to me. So as soon as he mentions that authority has been given and there is no authority higher, no president, no king on earth, there's no disciplinarian, there's nobody with authority greater than Jesus. And he said, go and make disciples of all nations. Nothing in heaven, on earth or under the earth has the authority to stop this process. Yes, I know their laws may try and I know they do things, but it cannot ultimately stop the work of Jesus. He will make a way to get discipleship done. It's very important to him. Now, the next thing he says, make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them. And baptizing them is crucially important because to be baptized, it's almost like the first test of obedience. If you confess Jesus is Lord, that really should mean that from now on I've taken him as my Lord. Lord means boss. It means controller, the one who's in charge. The old saying was he may be resident, but is he president? In other words, it's one thing to invite Jesus in. It's another thing to surrender to him completely as the Lord of of your life. When someone's baptized, it's a first evidence that they're accepting of doing what he says to do and being led by his spirit. Like one man said to me once, why should I be baptized? And I said, I'm not looking for reasons not to be baptized. I'm finding every reason I can to be baptized because it's what Jesus said to do. And even if you don't fully understand all the ramifications of baptism and all its symbols and everything that it means, that obedience needs to be there simply because he said to do it. Those who believe and are baptized will be saved. Faith alone is not enough. Remember, James said, even the devils believe and tremble, but they're not saved because they don't submit, they don't obey, they're not worshippers. For us to be saved, we've got to believe and be baptised. It means believe and start surrendering to the fact that Jesus is Lord and have him control you. And the way that begins is simply through that confession. We confess Jesus is Lord. And the more we confess it, the more he is licensed in our life to guide us and guide us through the inner witness and by his spirit, which is a lot different than guiding through the mind. Even though it will take some guidance through the mind, you start to flow with the wind of the spirit and God's got his way of getting you to where he needs you to be. Amen. I want to start too with a prophetic statement. Jesus' instruction 
to make disciples was spoken in the all authority he had just announced. Therefore, this directive has the supernatural and divine power of self-fulfillment. So even as we're looking at this word and even as I'm preaching this word, a grace comes on us to obey it, to fulfill it, to be disciples and to disciple others. In other words, this has to come to pass. It's supernaturally graced of God. Our Lord Jesus fully believes and expects when he returns for his church that she'll be making disciples who are followers of him that are also part of his glorious church, a spotless, pure bride that's making disciples for others. For example, my parents were Christians. They trained me to be a Christian. They discipled me in it. They discipled me to go to church whether I wanted to go or not go. There was never a choice or even a decision to make about whether we go to church on Sundays. It's Sunday, we go to church. I was discipled through them. My sister became the youth instructor when I was at church and I learned from my sister, someone in the family. My uncle and auntie had been missionaries on the field way up in North Queensland. When they came back to Victoria, my uncle took up being a primary school teacher and straight away started an after school class in which he would train young people and disciple them in the things of God. He started a group for children everywhere he went to be discipled. And of course, way back in the day, they used flannel graphs, they used coloring in books, they used anything they could, but it was always in his heart to disciple others. His calling was to do it with children. He was a primary school teacher. Me and Rosanna, when we became full-on Christians, we instinctively knew that we had to disciple. Straight away, the guitarist was living with us when he became a Christian, and we got the sound guy to move in when he became a Christian, and we all lived in that one house, and Rosanna's sister was there too initially, then it became our friend Maxine, and we all were disciples. We started a home group in our house. We went to a home group. We got the idea, if they can have it like that, this is how a home group runs, we can do that. People started to come because we were fairly well known for being a band. So there was no effort to get people in. People came in and we started to disciple them, to be quite honest. That's how I became a teacher of the word. I didn't even know I had a gift for teaching. But I remember that first home group. We got everybody in. We knew how to sing. The guy whose idea it was to start the home group didn't even turn up. When they finished the singing, Rosanna packed up a guitar. I thought to myself, somebody's got to teach. Every eye in the room was looking at me. So I grabbed the nearest Bible and I said, let's open our Bibles to Romans chapter 8, because I'd been reading that in the morning. And that's, that's literally how I started ministry, right there on the spot. Amen. So don't be surprised if I expect others to start on the spot, because it's one of God's ways. Amen. So after we got that home group going in our house, we were still going to a different home group. We are going to church on Sunday. But... I started a home group in another house and I would go there feeling absolutely inadequate and unable and all the way driving there, I had to repeat over and over again, I have the mind of Christ, I'm one spirit with the Lord, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Then I found an obscure psalm that said, open your mouth wide and I will fill it. Amen. I'm an able minister of the new covenant. I had to repeat that every time I drove there. Then within a short time, they asked me to start a group for teenagers at church on Sunday. Started with six kids. Five of them got saved. The next week, some more came. A few more got saved. And it wasn't long before it was a growing group. And it was a group of disciples. And we started to take them on outings. They came with us to some concerts. And we had events for them. It turned into a youth group. It was a discipleship group where kids came together because of the drawing power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. You know, in all of these discipleship places, God moved very powerfully. Our house was known as a discipleship house. People would come around for prayer all times of day and night. Some would come around to get their demons cast out. It was a constant hotbed of discipleship activity. 
which took us a lot of spiritual warfare. We were getting hammered all the time ourselves. We're always going on fasts and believing God and reading the Bible, going off in our band for outreaches. But I want to say right now, Jesus put in our heart an instinctive vision that we knew we had to make disciples. And today to find out how this is supposed to operate in the glorious church, we're going to look at how did discipleship happen in God's words. We're going to look at four points. The first point is Jesus had a discipleship slash apprenticeship program. This breaks down into four sub points, which is following Jesus. He had a teaching learning program where he taught, they learned. There was an on the job training, assessing, coaching, apprenticeship style factor to this. And there was also love and closeness, relational nearness. And Jesus never stopped loving those he was discipling. So let's look at this step by step. The first step was following him. And remember, Jesus made this amazing statement. Follow me and I will make you. I will make you fishes of men. I translate that in my head is follow me and I'll make you competent at fishing for men. Because I was a competency-based trainer in the Bible college I used to lead, and so I had to learn about competency-based training, training and assessment. And I see Jesus doing that through the Bible, through the Gospels, and I've gone ahead and written nine books on this in a series about following Jesus. I call it LEAD, following Jesus step by step in this apprenticeship program, seeing what he taught them, what they learned, what they did on the job, how he assessed them, how he corrected them, and how they developed right through to their graduation. It's a great study, and I encourage you to do it. Amen. Matthew 4, 18 to 20. And Jesus, walking by the Sea of Galilee, saw two brothers, Simon called Peter and Andrew his brother, and they were casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. Then he said to them, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. They immediately left their nets and followed him. So Jesus' discipleship begins with that call, Follow me. It's a learning contract, the way I see it. You follow me, and I'll make you. If you follow I will get it done. It's like a contract I could never offer as a VET trainer. I say to them, you come to college, you pay your fees, that's your part of it. I will teach you the best I can. I will train you practical things and I will assess you. And if you take advantage of the training and of the assessing and of all of this coaching, you can grow to competency. But Jesus is a much stronger promise than I could ever make. He said, if you follow me, that's your condition. Keep following, keep turning up, keep going. He said, I will get you there. And then he makes a whole lot of other promises to go alongside this, like you'll go through some pruning, some tests and trials. You'll get some correction. Whom the father loves, he chastises. There's lots of promises that go with this. But if you keep following, Jesus will get you there. He will bring you to competency and release you into effectiveness in your call and your assignment in the body of Christ. Other scriptures where Jesus says, follow me. Matthew 8, 22, he said to them, follow me. Matthew 9, 9, follow me. So he arose and followed. Matthew 10, 38, whoever does not take up his cross and Follow me is not worthy of me. Matthew 16, 24, he said, take up his cross and follow me. Then in Matthew 19, 21, he said, you'll have treasure in heaven and come follow me. It's all about following Jesus. Amen. I repeat, Jesus will make you competent at what he's called you to be and do if you follow if you sit at his feet and listen to his training and keep following him, follow him to the classroom, but also follow him when he says, get in the boat, go to the other side. When he's asleep in the boat and the storm is looming, 
you stay in the boat, you keep following and you get to the other side. You face down the demons in the man, keep following no matter how scary, how testing, how trying it is. And he will not only get you to the other side, but he will bring you to competence. Yes, even you. So the first thing about Jesus' apprenticeship was follow me. The second thing is teaching. Now I talked about in the previous message about the law of first mention, where something's first mentioned in the Bible is the way God intends it to be used. And so the first mention of the word disciple in the New Testament is found here in Matthew chapter 5, verses 1 and 2. And it said, And seeing the multitudes, he went up on a mountain, and when he was seated, his disciples came to him. Then he opened his mouth and taught them. So disciples is mentioned in the context of Jesus teaching them in a classroom style setting on the side of the mountain where he goes from Matthew 5, 6 and 7, takes them through that basic groundwork of his kingdom's culture. And even the word disciple in Greek, it means pupil or learner. So there's definitely teaching involved. And I can feel Jesus's enthusiasm prompting me and prodding me to keep teaching the word. Amen. The third thing about Jesus' discipleship is on the job, on the job apprenticeship, on the job training, on the job coaching, on the job assessments. And I've mentioned this before, but it's Matthew 8, 23. When he got into a boat, his disciples followed him. I think this is hilarious because there's at least 13 people there. Jesus had 12 close followers and then there's Jesus. They're all in one boat. You can't get your own space. You can't get your own cave. You remember what Jesus said just before they got in the boat? A man that was a scribe came to him and volunteered to follow Jesus. He said, Lord, I'll follow you. And Jesus said, foxes have holes, birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. It sounds like Jesus didn't have a home, but what it means is that the scribe, probably like me when I'm working here, he has his desk set up, he probably had his candles all arranged, somewhere to keep his drinks, somewhere over here at a bookshelf, he had a nice open window there to let in the natural light. He had a little cave set up, somewhere to lay his head. He was a scribe. He was writing out scriptures, he was looking at commentaries, reading, studying and understanding, he wanted to follow Jesus. Maybe Jesus picked up on the fact that he thought following him was only about the classroom. And Jesus is saying, no, it's more than the classroom. You've actually got to get into the boat with 12 other people. And it only takes one of them to rock the boat. We're all in this together. And when you get out there, you can't be like the star of the 1960s sitcom, which was Maxwell Smart. When he got into a situation where they wanted to kill him, he'd say, I quit this job. But when you're in the boat out in the middle of the lake, you can't quit. You can't get out. The storm was coming. They're all in this boat. They've got to go through it together. It doesn't matter if somebody's upsetting you, insulting you, doing things in a way you wouldn't want to do it. You're going to have to get on if you want to survive. That's discipleship. And when they got to the other side, the madman came running out of the tomb, screaming full of demons, running at them. They probably wanted to get back in the boat and row it faster than it's ever been rowed. But they had to listen to Jesus, stare down the demons and watch the way he dealt with it. And of course, having seen how he dealt with both the storm and the demon, Jesus expected them to learn and to copy. Amen. So it's definitely an on the job training. Jesus followed this up with this statement. No one having put his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. You know, you might not be familiar with what a plow is, but once you put your hand to following Jesus and he's in front and you're following him, if you even look back, you're not fit for the kingdom of God. Keep following and he will make you competent. The fourth part of Jesus' discipleship program is love. He loved those that were with him. And I love the way this is written in the Bible because Jesus chose 12 
out from all those that were his disciples or learning from him to be his apostles, special apprentices being trained to do what he was doing. Let's read first the account of this in Luke 6, 12 to 13. Jesus went up on a mountain to pray and he prayed to God all night. So this choice he's making is not made lightly or easily. At daybreak, he called together all of his disciples and chose 12 of them to be apostles. Now we read it from Mark, the same incident from Mark's perspective. And he went up on a mountain and called to him those he himself wanted. And they came to him. Then he appointed 12 that they might be with him. This is the other side of the coin. Following him, learning in a classroom, learning on the job, being trained, coached, assessed, discipled, shaped, twisted, tested, going through fiery trials, etc. is one part of it. But this is another part, that they might be with him. They were with him. And then they were able then to watch Jesus, watch him, to get to know him personally. So how did discipleship happen in God's word? Number one, Jesus had a discipleship, apprenticeship, vision and program. Number two, Jesus authorized and commissioned his graduates to make disciples like he did and as led by the Holy Spirit. Number three, the Jerusalem apostles made disciples as led by the Holy Spirit. And number four today, the apostle Paul made disciples with very interesting spirit-led techniques and variations to his technique. And I just want to ask you this. Have you got someone you're discipling? Who's discipling you? Let's pray. Father, as we've looked at the Word of God, we thank you that you've been guiding and leading us to see what you say in your Word about this vision and how you want it to come to pass. In Jesus' name. Now, while we have this attitude of prayer, I want to ask you a question. Are you a disciple of Jesus? To get there, Jesus says the first thing is to be born again. Because in his word, unless you're born again, you can't see the kingdom of God. And unless you're born again, you can't enter the kingdom of God. And he went on to say in John 3, you must be born again. Today I'm going to show you how to do that so that you can begin following Jesus, learning from him and letting him guide you in life and to flood you with his revelation and disciple you into all that God created you to be. Simply say this prayer after me. Say this, Jesus, now say it to God with all your heart, Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross for me. I turn from my old life. Thank you for paying for my sin. I receive your forgiveness and I receive your new birth. I want to be born again. Today, Jesus, I receive you as my Saviour. I confess you are my Lord. By your grace, I start following you from this day forward. I'll be baptized at the earliest convenience and I now am your disciple. Disciple me in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, God bless you. Thank you so much for watching today.